Hi guys, welcome back to Will the Beard Reviews and welcome back to the Rewind Review series here on the channel where we're talking about Grant Morrison's new X-Men and today we're on to issue 134. Now, last issue, 133, uh, I said seemed like the start of a new era or a new kind of like the next chapter, the next big thing in Grant Morrison's run and this one, 134, strangely feels like the same way. It's like the start of a new, um, new story arc that's going on in this this. Um, we get new characters just like we did last issue, but the two story arcs have nothing to do with each other. There is a mention of this one as to what one of the characters was doing um, in, in that previous issue, so we'll, be, we'll see where this goes. Also, this one is set um, basically almost entirely at the school with one lo other location being uh, gone to, and then it looks like on the cover for the next one we get into the story arc Riot at Xavier, so I don't know how the arc from 133, that, or that seemingly started in there is going to play in, but we'll see how, how that goes. So before we get into this, I um, just want to thank you guys for watching this. I think we're about, this is 134. We started at 114 and this run ends at 154. So with this issue, we are like halfway through Grant Morrison's run. It's been a hell of a ride. Thank you guys so much for watching. I think each one of these reviews has, uh, they're all averaging at about 100 views after they've been up uh, a day or two. So thank you so much for that. Thank you for the great comments. We've had a lot of great conversation down in there. Please, please continue that because we're going to keep going through this. We're going to hit, go all the way through 140. So thank you guys for that. Um, also, I don't talk about it much. Um, there's always a, uh, there's a little slide that comes in after the little uh, intro uh, jingle there. Um, I do have a page if you want to check that out, the link is in the description below. Also, I have an Ask Me Anything tip page. If you go there, uh, you can leave a tip, a monetary tip for the channel and leave a question and I'll answer that in a standalone video. And also, recently I've had a few viewers ask me about sending me physical things. Um, so I did go ahead and get a P.O. box. I think this is the first time I've mentioned it on the channel. That other correspondent has been off the channel. So I'll put up my P.O. box on the screen right now as well as leave it in the description down below if you want to send me anything there that would be great to get some fan mail or if you just want to talk with me outside of the comment section I have an Instagram uh, a Twitter and just a plain old email address down there if you want to send me a shout out or uh, talk to me that's not in the comments down below all right with all of that out of the way let's dive into issue 134 which features another amazing Jean Grey cover however there is no Jean Grey in this issue, so that's that's really odd. So let's go ahead and, and dive into this one. And like I said, this one pretty much... Um takes place exclusively at the school and we get another new character introduction in this one this time it is Quentin Quire that's right the dude who eventually becomes Kid Omega however he is not quite there yet he is still just kind of a douchier version of Peter Parker um, in this issue even kind of dresses like him with the sweater and the glasses and the uh, the kind of high water pants and everything like that so um, really cool stuff also we get Another um, cool little Easter egg um, nugget here, Jumbo Carnation, which we have seen recently in Jonathan Hickman's run um, when uh, he's a fashion designer and he was putting together um, basically the, the attire for Emma Frost and for the entire um, uh, ruling board of the Hellfire Trading Company. I remember reading that. I was like, Jumbo Carnation, I feel like I know that character. I vaguely, vaguely remember that character and someone pointed out that it, that character originated here in Grant Morrison's run and boom here we go although we don't get much of the character character is just here for literally two pages uh, before um, he's um, um, murdered there on the street so coming out of um, a nightclub and then gets attacked by some people and apparently they um, shove a little bomb down his throat that's what's happening um, right there and later on one of the detectives or, or uh, beast say that his Teflon skin contained the explosion so he just like exploded inside which is a horrible horrible way to go all right, so now we go here to our school. We get kind of our cast of characters um, for this particular issue. We get um, Glob appearing here. Uh, Herman, I believe, is his name. He actually first appeared in, I believe it was issue 118. We see him walking um, in the background. I think this might be his first 
speaking appearance. I could be wrong about that. I did not. I neglected to look up that bit of trivia. And then we also get Quentin Quire there. He's putting together some uh, anti-gravity things there for... Um, for Martha, who was the brain in a jar that showed up in the germ-free generation um, story arc. Actually may have shown up in the annual. I can't remember where she showed up. And then we got uh, four of the five, Step for Cuckoos, and then Slick and Tattoo here in the back who play heavy into this issue. And Slick is telepathically telling everyone that Jumbo Car Nation is dead. And this is where, and Quentin says here, hey, do, do you mind getting out of my head that, you know, Get out of my head. Don't telepathically tell me stuff. And he says, I'm trying to currently make anti-gravity floats for Martha, okay? And all she's got is the memory of body. And Slick says here, yeah, well, at least she's alive and thinking about it. Jumbo Carnation is dead, loser. The uh, the best mutant designer to ever live. Some bunch of human retards blazed him right outside X-Factory in Mutant Town, Quentin. He just kind of says, oh, and sinks down. And again, kind of has that nice uh, 60s Ditko um, Stanley. Lee era uh, Peter Parker look going and so Slick and Tattoo walk out and he says I'm going to write a tribute song uh, for him it's like okay yeah you you go and do that right um, so you kind of got the cool kid versus the nerdy kid here going on maybe a Flash Thompson versus uh, Peter Parker thing uh, thing going on and then uh, Quentin here saying Tattoo only likes Slick because he looks cool not because of what he is and Glob says but what he is, Quentin, is a super cool guy with guitar and leather pants. I wish I could be like Slick. Apparently all you need is a guitar and leather pants to make you cool in high school, at least at the uh, Xavier Mansion, right? And so then we get a scene here where um, Kid Omega is kind of pining after one of the Stepford Cuckoos. He's actually attracted or uh, attached to um, Sophia, or, or Sophie, and then Glob is like, which one is Sophie? Uh, they're th th all four of them look the same and Quentin keeps reminding him there's five there's five step for cuckoos all right so uh Glob and Quentin kind of go out into um the, the courtyard there and Quentin pulls out this cool page from the Daily Bugle he says this is the front page from the Daily Bugle on the day I was born it's right from around the time the first mutants started showing up in public and I think that's a really interesting way of kind of setting up this internal timeline to the X-Men, as we all know, time is really squishy there in the X-Men universe. I mean, you had Scott Summers and the rest of the original crew who were teenagers back in the 60s, and now we're into, like, the early 2000s here, so they should be, like, well into their 50s if time really meant anything in comics. So this is an interesting way of, of showing you know, the, the the timeline, like almost the generations of mutants, I would say. The first um, kind of modern generation of mutants in the Marvel Universe would be like um, uh, Magneto and Xavier's um, era. And then, you know, one generation after that, you got that first crew of X-Men and now they've grown up and now there's exponentially more and more mutants. And now we've got like enough to have like a full class here at Xavier Plus, you know, the 16 million that were at Genosha and, and lots of uh, stuff like that. And so um, we get an interesting thing. Uh, it, it feels like a throwaway line, but uh, Glob gives uh, Quentin a bunch of crap here about he just keeps eating candy bars. Uh, he actually says there's going to be five of you if you keep eating them, talking, kind of referencing um, the cuckoos, and he just kind of waves him off. And uh, Quentin then goes back to the, the paper here, and he says, um, this is awe-inspiring, kind of, you know, holding some reverence um, around it. And then um, someone comes up and says he's got a call from his mother, and he goes and, and takes the call there. We don't find out what that call is about until um, later on. I uh, got a cool interaction here with the Cuckoos and... Um, and Emma. Um, I love how... I don't know if I've talked about this before, but I love how the speech bubbles they point to all of the different cuckoos like they're all like talking in unison that would be really cool if they could whenever they either make another x-men movie or an x-men tv show which i think they should do a tv show versus a movie but that's a subject for another um another video um i like it'd be cool if they could find um quintuplets to play the stefford cuckoos and have them talk in unison like that or if they have to cgi it i get it but it'd be it'd be really really cool um to be able to do that and so the 
the cuckoos here are complaining to Emma about uh, Quentin, and um, they're like, there's something, they say there's something creepy about him, and she says, or maybe it could be that he's Professor Xavier's prize pupil, and you're a chief rival, huh? She's kind of, you know, playing with him a little bit. It's like, is he really creepy, or is he just your academic rival? And I gotta say, he's a little bit creepy, and he gets creepier um, even uh, a little bit later, I think, in, in Riot at Xavier's, um, if I'm remembering that correctly. Uh, so we go here to um, the 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 crime scene where Jumbo Carnation uh, was killed, and Hank is kind of doing uh, or Beast is doing the Beast thing, sniffing around, um, gathering evidence, and trying to see what's there after they've been um, called in uh, by this cop here. And let's look. This picture of this cop looks, he does not look human. Like, his eyes are just, like, unhumanly open, and, like, his hair is reflective. It almost looks like a helmet. Um, like, maybe something, like, Vision trying to imitate being a human or something there. It's it's very, very odd. And so, um, apparently, uh, apparently Beast, during some sort of uh, fight, helped this guy give, um, help his wife give birth. Um, and I love this quip, um... Uh, from Beast back to him, uh, when he doesn't remember, he says, Ah, oh, I'm sorry, Officer Foster, all humans look alike to me. A very, very nice little dig there. Um, and then we get some more fun interaction here. Um, Scott here says, uh, I didn't agree to have my picture being taken by the press. I seriously hate having my photograph taken. I always come out looking stiff and inhuman. And the cop says, the camera never lies, my friend, which I, I thought that was uh, pretty hilarious. Then they walk off and uh, the, the cop tell or congratulates Hank or Henry uh, on, on coming out as gay, which I thought was pretty funny. And then they have a little bit of a, a conversation here around that. The X-Men have a helicopter, too? I mean, I've always seen, you know, the Blackbird jet, classic classic X-Men. Apparently, they get helicopters, too. Apparently, uh, Xavier's putting that uh, $3.5 billion net worth uh, to work, buying them sweet helicopters and airplanes and stuff, right? <laughs> um, so... They have some more conversations and stuff like that, and they there's a cool line here uh, from Beast to um, to to Scotch. He, he says, "Consider this a friendly warning, and be aware of the late summer frost." If you catch what I mean, you're basically telling him, "Stay away from Emma Frost." Um, they also have a conversation about. Um, Scott asks him, all this manifestation of the Phoenix stuff, you're the doctor asking Hank, and he says, Scott, look, Jean is a grown-up Omega Mutant. On the Richter scale, she'd be a 12. If she was a mountain, she'd be an Olympus Mons on Mars. I ran her through every diagnostic, and she's fine. And Scott says, I want that to be true, Hank, but you can't run a diagnostic for what Jean's experiencing. There are instruments for what she is. And Beast says, well, as your physician and best friend, I think you're just projecting your own feelings fears onto Gene. You seem to be holding back a lot, Scotty. I mean that more than usual. Now, I really like this conversation because it goes into something that a few commenters have talked about. One specifically, um, a comment on yesterday's uh, yesterday's being well, yeah, the 133. I'm um, talking about Gene and how she's a really full and actualized um, character. Probably one of the better characterizations of Gene um, maybe ever in, in kind of the history of X-Men. And I really do like the characterization of Gene here. I don't know if I've spent enough time on that, but I really do like what uh, Morrison is doing with with Gene here. All right, um, so they uh, they get back to the school and they actually have some some conversations here about how um, they were you know trying to impress Gene like way back in the silver in the you know air quotes silver age back in like the olden days when they were just that um, uh, original crew. And talking about, you know, reminiscing about how Xavier would draw them, like, little booklets about um, how to know who their villains were. He says, uh, um, uh, well, you remember those uh, little scrapbooks Professor Xavier used to hand out? And we had to learn to identify the colors for all the weird costumes the bad guys wore. Whenever life seems strange, I like to think about that. And one of them says, Bobby used to have nightmares about that weird pendant. Who was that guy again? So just reminiscing about the good old days, which which I really like kind of the old guard here talking about the good old days and the high school days when we're dealing with a very high school story um, with Quentin and the cuckoos and slick and tattoo and, and all of that really good kind of juxtapositions like we have like the the, the the original generation has grown up and now we're going back to kind of the core of X-Men and the kind of the, the high school of it all which is really cool uh, so they get back to um, the school here 
Um, Beast says Jean sends her regards from Hong Kong. That's kind of plays into what I was talking about, where we had the story arc from last issue that really felt like it started something new, and then this one here also feels like it starts something new, so maybe these will kind of go back and forth and uh, shuffle back and forth between each other as um, as the issues go on. Apparently someone... Um, and there, there's some sort of Earth Day. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. What is it? Dance of the Planets um, celebration going on, and someone put out a cigarette on um, this model of Earth where Genosha was. Some kind of black humor there. And then we go here to a confrontation between Quentin and Slick, where um, Slick is there in the uh, in the courtyard playing his guitar. Looks kind of like a resonator, uh, like a desperado uh, westerny kind of guitar, singing a song about Jumbo, which is kind of cringy. And then even Glob is like, "Man, those are some really embarrassing lyrics, huh, Quentin?" And so Quentin confronts Slick here, and he says, "Slick, I have a question." In what way exactly does this stupid performance benefit Jumbo Carnation or help avenge his murder? And Slick says, do you have a point to make, Choir? And he says, I don't know. Have you any idea what happens inside when you find out you're not the person you thought you were? I do. How about you, Slick? And then Quentin turns off his power and says, who wants to see Slick naked? And reveals who Slick really is in these this, this, this mutation. And he's been psychically projecting like a different form of himself to to everyone and he's you know tries to save and he's like this is i'm i'm still mean you can see on tattoo's face um her tattoo shift and she's saying um loser here and quentin says it's all fake an illusion that's what cool is that's what charisma is it's what everything is and we're just like why is he so hell-bent on bringing down the cool kid obviously you have the 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 bullied nerd kid versus the the cool kid dynamic there but we go to this next page and we do find out why Quentin is the way he is apparently that phone call from his mom was that he was adopted and so he feels basically like he's been cut off at the knees everything that he knows has been changed so he's lashing out at the cool kid there at the school because the cool kid is an easy target um, and, and has a mark on him and so they basically he got you know called into the principal's office and they've got um, Xavier and and Hank there kind of talking to him. Xavier says uh, you test highly for superior intelligence and these anti gravity floats you've invented for Martha's brain uh, a mobility she never thought you've had. You're one of the most uh, Xavier's Institute's most promising students, Quentin. So you understand why it seems uh, so out of character for you to humiliate another student in this way. Um, and so, uh, basically offering, like, do you want to go, you know, send him off to, to the, another retreat, right? And he says, uh, I don't need a retreat, uh, I just need a haircut um, down here. Beast actually defends Slick. He says, Slick was a pain, uh, but no one got hurt. I think it was wrong for you to take away his tangible ego. It took him a long time to overcome his shyness by building an illusory self-image. And uh, then this is where we find out he was adopted. Quentin says, I just found out I was adopted today, Professor. It made me think about things differently. And sometimes I think about that, uh, and, and sometimes I think all that seems to matter to you is how being on television and telling everyone how wonderful your brave new world is. Well, I live in the brave new world, and it's not as shiny and perfect as you'd like to think. You're always selling this future that never arrives. You preach utopia, but you never deliver on that dream we keep hearing about. And then, ooh, that is, that's some, those are some harsh words um, for Xavier, but they're not untrue words, at least at this point in the X-Men universe. I think um, the, you know, Jonathan Hickman's run that we're in right now, um, the, I think that that promise has been delivered upon, um, but at least, you know, certainly not now at this point, right? Especially after the Genosha massacre. And I love Xavier here. He just deflects, right? He says, uh, Quentin, I know that nothing seems to make sense right now, but we didn't bring you here to lecture or punish you. There is another reason. And then uh, hands it over to Dr. McCoy. And he says, um, I just wanted to bring up the fact that I noticed some anomalies in your brain test result. Right now, your brain is burning sugar 15 times faster than normal it's literally on fire hence all those big thoughts and ideas we thought um 
uh, we'd like to put you on a mega glucose diet to, and keep you under observation. Wish I could be put on a mega glucose diet. Dang it, I'd love me some snacks. Uh, and he says you may be experiencing um, some a secondary mutation. Um, something I think I glazed over um, back over here. I just remembered it. Um, I want to circle back to um, the crime scene. The cop says they found an inhaler with um, hypercortisone D, which I think think it becomes they identify as a drug yeah kick um hank says hypercortisone d this is the new drug i told you about mutant kids are calling it kick and i believe if i remember correctly it enhances powers and um quentin is either now or becomes a pretty heavy user of it almost addicted so um quentin goes to the crime scene uh, you can see mutant scum he deserved it written on the concrete there and quentin says everyone deserved it uh you fat loser um the professor's a fake mom and dad are strangers everything a lie so he's just he has no idea what to believe here there's a even a, like a dog peeing on the flowers there uh some punk kids come by and kick the flowers at the memorial so he runs into a barber shop to get that haircut that he wants probably the haircut that we most you know notably associate him with and he says can you look at like my can you make it look my or can you make my hair look like the one in the picture and then hands the the barber that um that newspaper clipping and then we get a preview for some uncanny x-men stuff going on so all in all a pretty decent issue i definitely like the shoving back to kind of the high school era the good high school feel very very much a teen drama going on with slick and quentin and the cuckoos and you have your stereotypes there the cool kid the uh the nerd kid the disaffected nerd kid and then the hot girls with um with the stefford cuckoos there and then you know continuing the the mutant uh prejudice and everything with um jumbo carnation being being killed in the street so another good issue and i know we got some cool stuff coming just around the bend this is very much a setup issue and we'll get that payoff here in the next couple issues so guys what you think about issue 134 of new x-men let me know your thoughts and opinions down in the comments down below like you guys always do thank you so much for watching if it's your first time here at the channel please consider hitting that subscribe button for me it would mean a lot and until next time we'll see you at the comic shop